Hello, David Foster with you once again here on Roundtable as we continue to examine the ripple effects of the coronavirus. What is it doing other than infecting people? Well, there's a battle at the moment over who's to blame for the outbreak. The US president praising and then criticizing China and then attacking the World Health Organization. China suggesting that the virus was actually brought into its country by the US military. Does it matter? what the story is behind COVID-19? So in the battle for the global narrative, we have China, the United States, and then there's Russia. Kremlin-backed media saying that coronavirus was created as a tool for the benefit of the United Kingdom. Superpowers like China and the USA are now blaming each other for the spread of the coronavirus. US President Donald Trump has angered Beijing by continually referring to COVID-19 as a Chinese virus. Trump's administration is withholding funding to the World Health Organization, accusing it of pandering to China and it's not only Trump. Many experts are angered that the WHO seems reluctant to hold China to account for its initial cover-up of the scale of the disease. A major German newspaper estimates that China owes Germany $162 billion in damages. For its part, the Chinese government has pushed unfounded conspiracy theories that the US military brought the coronavirus to Wuhan. While some Russian state-backed media outlets have carried claims that COVID-19 was created as a tool for the UK's benefit. But many critics say President Trump is playing the blame game to distract from his own incompetent handling of the virus outbreak in the US. Will the battle for the narrative prevent a united global effort in the battle against COVID-19? Well, let us start the conversation in a short while. We'll be talking to Raffaello Pantucci from the Royal United Services Institute and to John Berryman, who's from Birkbeck University. But first, let us say hello to Isabel Hilton, Chief Executive of China Dialogue, and to Thomas Sutton, Professor of Political Science at Baldwin University. Great to have you both on the programme. Again, what was it the Russians were saying about the Brits, that they'd been smearing something in Wuhan in the same way that they smear nerve agent on Skripal's door handle? You can say what you like about what they said, but we are seeing, are we, not well, you as first, Isabel, a, a different kind of war here than the one against the disease itself. Yes, we're seeing we're seeing a war, a, a, con a global contest over the narrative, and and it's just as important, really. You know, you have China trying to divert attention from the first four or five weeks when they censored the news, but but didn't take action against the against the virus. Uh, and you have the United States trying to, at least the administration, trying to distract from its own early inaction, and each side is blaming the other. So, you know, who comes out of this uh, best uh, in, in the, the eyes of the world? That'll be quite an important thing for whose system is judged to have dealt most effectively with a global pandemic. Has China, Isabel, and then to you in a moment, Thomas, has it China rested back the narrative in its favour yet? It certainly tried very hard, but, but you know, it slightly depends who you ask. Uh, there are uh, populists in Italy, for example, who were very bitter about the perceived failure of the European Union to come to their aid and who have been very happy to give uh, publicity or propaganda opportunities to China. On the other hand, China's own propaganda opportunities have often misfired. Um, some of the kit that they have been handing out has been uh, defective, but also the, the propaganda is pretty heavy handed because it's essentially aimed at a domestic audience and convincing a domestic audience that, that the regime is much loved and admired around the world. And that hits, you know, it's pretty clunky for, for foreigners to watch this stuff and it rather exposes it as as regime propaganda. So, so far, I would say, you know, it's pretty even either way. Thomas, uh, negative bias in, in which people tend to believe bad things about other people, and the political leaders here are very well aware of that, that even if they do something good, it is the bad things for which they will be 
remembered. Is that at play here? Oh, absolutely. And I think the avoidance of looking like you've not done the right thing or done the wrong thing uh, is very much present in the minds of the leaders, particularly President Trump, who avoids blame like the plague, uh, literally, um, and who seeks to get uh, credit for anything that might remotely uh, represent something that he's done right. The problem he and all leaders face is that this is unprecedented. How do you control a disease like a pandemic? How do you uh, assert leadership trying to answer questions that nobody has answers to yet and that are being developed. Literally, we are flying the plane as it's being built, as is often said. Um, so I think there's a really um, fine line for leaders to uh, to walk. And the best examples, at least here, have been the leadership of governors, such as Governor DeWine here in Ohio, Governor Cuomo in New York, uh, who have really tried to focus on what are the public health experts telling us? What do we know and not know? Let's be honest and transparent about that with the public because we're asking people to do things that really are nothing short of draconian, stay at home, closing businesses, et cetera, now going on a month and more, uh, which are having a huge effect, as we know, uh, on our economy, uh, on social life, and potentially with a fall presidential election coming up, uh, very big consequences on who wins or loses that election. Is it the same the world over, Thomas, uh, in terms of this, we're talking about Russia, uh, we're talking about China, we're talking about the United States, but are there others turning on each other as well? Well, I think we're starting to see some tensions in uh, Africa in terms of how some of the sub-Saharan African countries are preparing for or trying to deal with this. Some are, in fact, in better shape because they have had to screen people as they come in and out of their country for diseases like yellow fever. This is common in, in some of the West African countries. But still, um, their health care systems are woefully inadequate to deal with any uh, remote possibility of the kind of pandemic effect that we've seen here in the United States and in China and in Italy. Um, and I think this may exacerbate political tensions and even civil tensions in some of these countries, particularly looking at places like Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, uh, some of the West African countries, Nigeria. Uh, this also could become an opportunity for some of the far extremist groups, some of the Islamist terrorist groups like Boko Haram, et cetera, uh, to try to take advantage of these situations with either terrorist activities or or the opposite, to try to be the source of aid for populations in need and then be seen as the heroes in these local settings. Uh, Isabella, are, are we seeing um, more of this negativity bias directed towards China on, on the basis that uh, praise is fickle, it, it, it is short-lived, and then the perception of China at the moment is that maybe it messed up? Uh, will that last? I think that positions will will harden. Uh, we're going into uh, a U.S. election, and it's fairly clear that for both sides, you know, who's toughest on China is going to be a key narrative. So the U.S. criticism of China is not going to let up, and the U.S. expectation that its allies will join in won't let up. Um, so, for example, you, you, there's, a, there's a dispute going on right now between Australia and, and China, with Australia joining the call for an independent inquiry. There are political elements here in Britain who've been asking for an independent inquiry into the origins of the pandemic. Uh, China's not going to do that. Uh, so that's going to be a source of contention. And then China will have to push back, for example, as we've seen an official spokesman of government Chinese government spokesmen float the idea that it was the U.S. military that brought the virus to Wuhan. So on both sides, we see these loose accusations, which are very dubiously sourced, have no particular evidence in the absence of uh, uh, of serious evidence that that you know can produce a definitive reply. You've also seen, and I absolutely agree, that this question of existing tensions particularly ethnic tensions, uh, can be exploited in a situation like this. So, you know, ne the border between Nepal and India, which is which is traditionally pretty open, is it's, it's somewhere, you know, Nepal is, it has accused Indian arrivals of bringing the virus in. In Guangzhou, in, in southern China, Africans were, and a lot of, you know, African migrants and students and workers in Guangzhou found themselves summarily evicted from their lodgings. They couldn't they couldn't find anywhere else to stay. They were having a very hard time because they, ironically enough, had been perceived by the locals as carrying the virus. So wherever you see a tendency to ethnic tension, uh, you, you layer on top of it the fears around the pandemic and you can get a very, very ugly situation. 
Uh, do you want to reflect on uh, UK politics in this and whether dogs eating dog in that case or have domestic politics been put to one side, uh, not only in the UK, but elsewhere as well? Well, I think temporarily, there's a temporary truce in, in the UK. Uh, Parliament actually comes back into session today, although virtually, which is rather a bit of a departure for, for the UK Parliament. But so far, opposition parties have been at pains to say that they, uh, that they are cooperating with the government on defeating the pandemic. But I think that now that Parliament is back in session and the and the Labour Party has a new leader, uh, so you know he's got to make his his mark somehow. We will see more interrogation of of essentially the failings of the government so far, because there have been many many missed targets and and much recrimination about a yeah. failure to deliver equipment and and you know that frontline staff need. So I think that things will hot up a bit. Uh, let me bring in Michael Fuchs, who's a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. This is one of the things he had to say. While China will continue trying to spin this crisis to its advantage to win headlines, at the very least, the United States can play the role of responsible leader rather than infantile finger pointer. Thomas, you first and uh, then you, Isabel. Is that at all likely? I think under this current president, it's highly unlikely, although we see President Trump operating on two levels. Publicly, we see him defending the United States, appealing to this nationalism uh, among his own supporters uh, that really calls for that opposition to China. We've seen that since he became president with his trade tariffs, et cetera. On the other hand, though, there is the backdoor dealings that do tend to also happen because he recognizes China as um, as important, both in global relations and in economic relations. Uh, I think coming out of this, what we'll see is uh, that uh, the president will have his rhetoric, and that will be the lead in a lot of the media coverage, but that I think we will also see the State Department and other departments, particularly defense as well, um, really trying to respond to where this pandemic represents um, the greatest threat, not just to populations in different countries, but also uh, the potential military implications, diplomatic implications, and even economic as well. Isabel, one of the other things that Mr. Fuchs said was the two countries might just end up building bridges that could be useful in tempering what he called the more dangerous aspects of their competition. There is perhaps some hope here. That would be a, a, a very positive development. Uh, one one area in which there were pretty strong bridges which were destroyed by Donald Trump uh, was in climate cooperation, the other crisis which hasn't gone away. Um, I don't see Trump rebuilding those bridges. He's much more of a transactional, you know, let's make more money out of this relationship president. Um, but frankly, um, he's also... I agree he's conflicted because he also tries to present himself as the best friend of every world leader. So, you know, at the same time as he's he's excoriating China, he, he's still trying to praise Xi Jinping. So it's a very, very inconsistent position. And, and if one good thing came out of this crisis, it might be some consistency in U.S. policy. But I'm not holding my breath yet. We haven't got a clue, really, have we? Uh, but thank you for giving us both of you. That's Isabel Hilton yeah. uh, and Thomas Sutton. The, the, the pleasure of your company and uh, the benefit of your expertise in these uh, very, very strange times. Thank you both. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let us at this stage welcome Raffaello Pantucci, who's a, a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute and John Berryman, associate lecturer in international relations at Birkbeck University. Great to have you both with us uh, once again. Raffaello, let me ask you, first of all, China seemed to lose the narrative at the very beginning of this. It was then blamed for what had happened. Has it, has it caught up? I think China is still uh, trying to catch up. I think what we've seen over the past uh, almost month now, is a real push by China to try to shift the narrative by showing itself as being on the front foot, as being the one that's providing medical aid to countries all over the world. So you see these stories that have been trumpeted by uh, the Chinese media um, and others uh, about Chinese medical aid arriving all over the place. But at the same time, we've had a very curious push by Beijing to try to shift uh, the blame of the narrative as well. Um, and there's had some voices coming, you know, quite specifically out of very senior parts of the Chinese government that have been saying that the whole origin of the virus is, in fact, a hoax and is, in fact, not in China and is potentially even in the United States. So you've had this really aggressive pushback by China 
um, over the past month, really, which has been on the one hand to try to spin a positive narrative showing how China is doing great and is doing well now in the world um, and is trying to sort of help everyone. But on the other hand, trying to shift a bit of the blame and trying to change the sort of international understanding and thinking around where it is exactly this virus. You see, you see what I'm wondering is, is um, while it may be doing these good deeds for whatever motives, will people see through that or does it not matter one bit? I mean, my interpretation has been that, frankly, the people who would be inclined to see it positively will see it positively. <laughs> and the ones who are inclined to see it in the other direction will see it in the other direction. I don't think it's really winning any hearts and minds. Actually, I think, in fact, within a European context, what it's doing is drawing more attention to China. I mean, China is an increasing part of the conversation, but for a very long time, it really wasn't. But now, you know, people are hearing about China and they're only really hearing about it in negative contexts be it Huawei and tech debate, or be it in the case of uh, the uh, coronavirus. So, you know, I think that the Chinese are making a lot of noise, but frankly, it's not positive noise that's winning them any new friends. John, we're talking about China, but we'll get on to the States in, in just a moment. I, I want to ask you, first of all, um, will this show up the shortcomings, if you like to call them that, of, of the Chinese system? Will it strengthen the leadership at home? What will it do? Difficult to say. Uh, just on the point you were raising with your first uh, correspondent, I think China's in a position where what was initially perceived to be a, an unfortunate glitch may be getting worse for China because there have been suggestions that uh, two research institutes in Wuhan uh, may have been uh, open to the charge that somehow they let the virus out. So uh, this, in some respects, it's, I think it's become more serious for China than uh, was the case previously. Um, Can I just jump in there as well? Um, because these are biological institutes and the US yeah. State Department was told about this about a year and a half ago. Big story right. in the Washington Post and elsewhere. Yeah. Does that show up US failings as well as Chinese ones, perhaps? No, I think it, it, I think certainly at the moment the, the, the problem is going to be for the Chinese to uh, rebut those accusations. Going a bit further, I think although Trump has certainly taken the opportunity to kick back against the uh, negative uh, implications of his current position. Uh, the attack on China is also matched with an attack on the World Health Organization. And I think it's worth noting that the World Health Organization is one of those many UN agencies that have often been open to accusations of uh, bureaucratic uh, sloth, uh, shortcomings in many respects of administration. And to that extent, therefore, I think Trump's withdrawal of the funding from the World Health Organization is uh, you know is something that uh, mm. should not just be t targeted on China. It's also uh, an issue that America's had with a lot of UN agencies that it helps to fund and has done over the last 50 years. But, but, but John, do you ever wonder why in times like this or at this particular moment, we see people pointing the finger rather than just getting on with tackling the, the problem, the health problem that the world is seeing? Why do they do it? Well, I think, uh, obviously, in, in terms of China's, uh, uh, Trump's attack on China, uh, it's a tactical move to try and remove uh, the focus of uh, negative opinion away from him. But I think it does fit into a bigger picture, which I want to maybe make here, that uh, US-China relations are on a steady tick-tick towards worsening relations. To that extent, uh, you know, Trump's attempts to isolate China on this uh, should not be seen to be a one-off. It's it's part of a general deterioration in U.S.-China relations, which I've I want to emphasise is going to be the main uh, feature of the next decade. Okay, uh, let me come back to you, Raffaello. Uh, I asked John about the Chinese leadership at home rather than um, in in the global context. Will, will this uh, will the attitude, the approach that the Chinese government is taking now, uh, give support to um, the leadership at home? Yes. I, mean, I think that, you know, everything uh, really that the Chinese government does, and arguably like most governments, um, is basically for a domestic audience. I mean, ultimately, governments uh, stay in power if a domestic audience, you know, wills them to uh, or votes for them. So, you know, for the Chinese government, the preeminent audience they're always talking to is ultimately in China. Um, and it's the audience of, you know, the Chinese citizenry and making sure they're happy. And what you've seen out of this particular conversation, and what I think is often missed uh, when looking at it from the outside, is the degree to which all of this plays uh, to a very strong nationalist sentiment at home that, frankly, the CCP has been stoking for some time. Um, all these stories that we hear about, uh, you know, the virus having potentially emanated from some lab, uh, a story that has been 
you know, pretty resoundingly uh, rebuffed in most cases. I mean, it's clear that the, or the origin of the virus is in China, but I think, you know, whether it came from one of these biological laboratories, I mean, if you dig into the details of these stories, it's not always clear that it's necessarily linked to them. Um, you know, but all of that plays into a narrative in China, which is that the West is out to get us any which way that they can. And so, the and the Chinese interest. people, sorry, 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 Raphael, the Chinese people yeah. will not be buying the argument that they were let down by their government at the very beginning, uh, with doctors saying this is a major crisis, disappearing, dying, um, and so many people being locked up arbitrarily. They, they won't know about that, or they won't buy that argument. Well, I think they might. They know about that. I mean, you can look at the case of Dr. Li Wenliang, the famous uh, Wuhan doctor who reportedly, you know, tried to alert his authorities in, in Wuhan, was then punished and had to do a sort of one of these self-criticisms publicly to show how, you know, incorrect he actually was, uh, when in fact, and then he later died of the virus, having, you know, gone back to try to help other people. Um, you know, he became a national hero. It was all over the press, and the government sort of did a huge about turn on him and elevated him to sort of martyr status within the state. So there is a very strong realization within China that the government's failed them. But I think what's, what the government does very carefully within China is try to first push the blame onto local officials. So the narrative within China is very much one of the failure happened in Wuhan, the failure happened in the city. It was the local authorities who failed to alert the central authorities. And this is a long-standing sort of narrative you see in China where, you know, the sort of the, the emperor sitting in Beijing, you know, is a sort of wise and all-seeing being. But, you know, if he's let down by his officials on the ground, there's very little he can do about that. And so the responsibility has shifted sort of onto that community. And that means that sort of the CCP core can remain in a sort of sense of power. Now, so that sort of strengthens the sense of... Just point out that the CCP the is the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party. Um, I'm just going to have to move on a little bit. In, in the first sure. half, John, we... we talked about Michael Fuchs, who used to work at a U.S. State Department, concentrating on um, Asia and Pacific. And one of the things um, Michael Fuchs said was, if the two countries can put all this behind them, they might end up building bridges that could be very useful in terms of the more dangerous aspects of their competition. Given the current situation, do you think that's at all possible? Uh, yes, I think it, you've had 50 years of the Cold War where the Soviet Union and the United States were adversaries. But throughout that period, there were always voices calling for dialogue, for a, a constructive attempt to build rational relations and to de-escalate possibilities of uh, you know, unforeseen um, military crises, nuclear crises and so forth. And to that extent, I think that uh, once the, the coronavirus crisis has subsided, uh, there are already discussions about to what extent nuclear arms control might have to include China, uh, along with uh, the Russian Federation and the United States in the post-start environment. So great powers uh, will have spats, they will have disagreements, they will have angry exchanges. But I think the task of diplomacy has always been, is today and will always be, to work for rational dialogue between great powers where the stakes at where the issues at stake are extremely important. And, and if the truth, if it eventually comes out, turns out to be an inconvenient truth um, at a time when US-China relations are perhaps improving, will we just never happen to know about it? <laughs> I've no idea. Could I add a point that the or previous uh, discussion uh, raised? I think in the current crisis, all pu public opinions in all countries look to their national governments. And to that extent, the Chinese people looking to their national government to provide them with the carapace for security is no different from that in uh, most of Europe. And I want to make the small point that the European Union, as a claimed supranational body, has been shown to be singularly deficient in its efforts to respond to the crisis in a timely and, and uh, sensible uh, fashion. John, thank you. Underlining, we underlining do, the we, we will probably do more states. of the European Union a little bit later, but <laughs> okay. it is something we've already uh, covered in this. So let me, as right. we come towards the end of the programme, go back to, to Raphael with exactly the same question that I've put to John, an inconvenient truth. If it turns out that China has made a massive mistake, whether it be a biological one or just in terms of the way that it's handled the crisis, and that truth is awkward uh, for world trade, for diplomacy, etc., etc., might it be the case that we'll never really know what happened? 
Uh, no, I think that, you know, we're going to keep getting it dug into. But I think the bigger problem is the fact that the U.S. and China have really shifted very far apart from each other at this point. And the kind of decoupling that we've seen being talked about throughout the uh, Trump administration is really kind of coming true. And the two are really starting to separate and go in different directions. And so I think the question is, that's going to really shape our international relations and affairs for the next few years. Um, and within that context, it will be very difficult to ever really get the absolute truth of what happened here because we'll see so many stories being spun. I mean, already you've got stories being spun by senior figures, you know, respectable, important positions within both the Chinese and the American government spinning different versions of the truth. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult to ever walk those back and completely eradicate them from the sort of common mind to discover what the absolute truth really was. OK, Raffaella, thank you very much. Indeed, uh, great to have you on the programme once again. And also you. Uh, to you, John Berryman, I didn't mean to interrupt you about the European Union. We will pro presumably return to that many times, but it is something we've already covered in this series on the ripple effects of the coronavirus. Appreciate you both coming on. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, that is it from me, David Foster, for this edition of Roundtable. We appreciate your company. Stay safe and we hope to have you with us next time we're here. Goodbye for now.